We want to continue our bacteriology class. And we started by talking about the characteristics of Enterobacter USA. And today we are looking at the genuses one by one. And we are looking at one interesting member of the family known as Escherichia coli, otherwise shortened as E. coli. Let's drive in. The genus E. coli currently consists of four recognized species. We have the Escherichia coli, we have the Escherichia fergusoni, we have the Escherichia apetai, Escherichia mammute. Now, out of all these um, species, Escherichia coli remains one of the recognized well-known species and it's formerly it's among the studied, among the well researched, among the well known. So in this study, we'll be looking at E. coli as one of the member of the Enterobacteriaceae family. Now, like every other enteric bacteria that lives in the gut of man, E. coli remains a notable bacteria. That is found in the gut of man and animal. They are commensals and they pose no danger. Commensals mean they live in the, they live inside the host or they live around the host or they live on the host without causing any harm while they benefit. So it is a common inhabitant of the gastrointestinal tract of man. However, we have certain strains of this E. coli that can cause various illnesses, such as food poisoning nitrate infection and pneumonia. Like I said, the primary habitat is the GIT of man, while the secondary habitat includes water, soil, food, and other surfaces. There are those pathogenic strains of E. coli that are responsible for these various types of infections we talked about, and they are also distributed in nature, and they are responsible for specific infection based on the sources where they are found or based on the medium of their transmission. They have specific infection, they have specific virulence genes, and they have specific symptoms. The first one is the steak, which is the sugar toxin producing E. coli, also known as E. coli 0157 or enterohemorrhagic E. coli. This uh, sugar toxin producing E. coli is found mainly or generally in such food items such as undercooked ground beef, contaminated lettuce or sprouts. It's basically a foodborne E. coli and causes bloody diarrhea. It has virulent factors. What virulent factors include the production of the sugar toxin that damage the vascular endothelial cells, causing bloody diarrhea and also hemolytic remic syndrome. The mechanism of action of this uh, toxin, or so to speak, the E. coli, causing disease, is to attach to epithelial cells and releases sugar toxin into the bloodstreams. Then the symptoms that ensue include bloody diarrhea, abdominal cramp, fever, vomiting, and can lead to kidney failure and anemia. So these sugar toxin produce E. coli and notorious for food poisoning outbreak. And we also have the EPEC. The EPEC, also known as enteropathogenic E. coli, is an important cause of diarrhea in infants in developing countries. They also possess virulent factors, which include bundle forming pili. They have the fimbri that is attached to intestinal epithelial cells, effacing toxin disrupting cell membranes. Now, they are there to this mucosa cell in small bowels, but they do not produce toxins. And the mechanism of action is to 
cause cell death and flu secretion after attaching to the epithelial cells, then leading to symptoms such as watery diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, abdominal cramps. Examples of their food source include contaminated milk, vegetable, or water. Another pathogenic E. coli is the E. tech, which is enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is commonly called the traveler's disease, responsible for traveler's diarrhea and watery diarrhea in children. It has a virulent factor which, in, which includes heat stable and heat labor toxin, which are stimulated, I mean, which simulate flu secretion into the intestinal limit. And the mechanism of action of this uh, toxin is to release, is, is to disturb the electrolyte when released. When the E. coli colonizes the small intestine, it releases the toxin that disturbs the electrolyte and water absorption, leading to water, watery diarrhea, then sometimes nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. The food source of these enterotoxigenic E. coli include contaminated water, unpasteurized milk products, and sometimes some food like rice and so on. So we also have enteroinvasive E. coli, which produce similar disease that is similar disease to shigellosis. Shigellosis is a common uh, foodborne disease attributed to Shigella. So the symptoms are similar. And these symptoms include fever, profuse water diarrhea, watery diarrhea, and abdominal cramps. The mechanism of action is by invading the epithelial cell and causing inflammation and tissue damage. And one of the sources include contaminated water, raw seafoods, and salad. We also have enteroaggregative E. coli, which produces acute and chronic diarrhea in persons. The virulent factor is by adherence or bowel formation at the intestinal mucosa. That is adhesive pimbre that makes it to attach to the intestinal mucosa. And the mechanism of action is by aggregating on the intestinal wall. When they, when they attach themselves to the intestinal wall, they disturb the normal function and nutrient absorption, leading to chronic watery diarrhea. And the symptoms in children is by showing stunted growth and malnutrition. They are usually associated with contaminated water, street food, and vegetables. So basically, all the pathotypes of E. coli are associated with hygiene, poor hygiene. This poor hygiene is as a result of non-careful or careless usage of substances that are meant for food production such as water food materials and so on and the last one is upec neuropathogenic e coli which is responsible for most urinary tract infection this type of e coli is usually not associated with food it is associated with nosocomial infection causing urinary tract infection in both male and female although most female experience this UTI more than male because of the uh, the female anatomical design, which allows easy flow or easy contamination of the E. coli at the vagina. So the urinary tract infection is more prominent in female. So the UPEC is the neuropathogenic E. coli. So all these E. coli pathotypes 
are strains of Estonisia coli under the same species. Isolation and laboratory identification of E. coli is by selective media and differential media. E. coli is a typical oxidase negative, catalyst positive, and indo positive bacteria. So, the, in the laboratory, E. coli can be isolated by the use of differential McConkey agar and EOC methylablum because E. coli is a lactose fermenter with pink colony. The McConkey agar provides the pink coloration that indicates E. coli as a lactose fermenter, while the EMB indicates E. coli colony as a metallic sheen, as seen beside this da I mean at this diagram. This diagram shows the colony of E. coli on EMB showing a green metallic color. And E. coli can be differentiated from other enteric bacteria by its positive reaction to methyl red, Wolfsburg-Kara and citrate test. Laboratory culture of E. coli, that is to isolate E. coli, is usually by carrying out an enrichment culture which involves the culturing of sample of E. coli from any source, probably from the feces or from the food, in a selective broad that will promote the growth of E. coli and suppress the growth of other contaminants, which may have more population than E. coli. Then, the E. coli is now subcultured on a selective agar, such as EMB, that contains inhibitor that will distinguish E. coli from other bacteria. So E. coli can then be isolated based on the colony uh, and the indicator, the agar, indicating that this is E. coli based on the color or based on the shape. But E. coli usually has a green metallic sheen on the EMB. The biochemical test can be carried out to confirm the identity of E. coli based on its enzymatic and metabolic characteristics, as well as the serotype based on the presence of the antigen of E. coli. E. coli is a versatile bacteria, and this uh, is one of the reasons why it is economically viable. It's very important in biotechnology this is as a result of its versatility E. coli grow fast within the next 30 minutes of isolation of um, subculturing of E. coli cell the organism can easily multiply into another generation and this makes it a suitable candidate as a model organism for research in genetics and also is a very good organism that expresses protein and is good in molecular biology. It has a cell that is able to accept genes, plasmids, and other necessary genes for genetic production. And also in food production, E. coli is used in production of fermented food like yogurt and cheese. And also in medicine. To use in production of antibiotics and pharmacy other pharmaceuticals. There are other organisms that are producing pharmaceuticals, produce drugs, but they have a slow growth or low yield. For the introduction of E. coli, by the use of E. coli, E. coli can be used to carry some of these genes by accepting the genes and use it to uh, produce the genes in a more larger quantity, better than the original strain that may have difficulty in growing as fast as E. coli and also E. coli is used in biological waste treatment plant to break down organic matters. This is also as a result of its versatility and also E. coli is used in environmental monitoring as an indicator of fecal contamination in water and food. Now this contamination is because E. coli is an indicator bacteria Indicator bacteria is a bacteria that is used to detect the presence of fecal contact 
physical content in water or food, which we call coliform text. With every other bacteria that causes infection and disease in humans, E. coli is also responsible for other different types of infections, such as UTI, as mentioned before. So, treatment of E. coli is by the use of antibiotics of the beta lactam or ammonium glycoside drugs. For example, we have cefotaxim of the beta lactam, which is a cephalosporin drug, and amikacin, which is uh, a uh, synthetic drug of the ammonium glycoside. So depending on the nature of the E. coli disease or infection, maybe a multi-drug resistance or a moderate or intermediate drug resistance to determine the type of antibiotics drug to be prescribed, perhaps to use a combination therapy or single therapy in this case. I have practice questions to test your knowledge of your assimilation in this course, your ability to interpret and to see how you can answer questions. So let's go.